Uh, for those of you I haven't met, which is most of you, I'm Mark Stabile. I'm a professor here at INSEAD, and I'm the director of the James and Kathleen Stone Center for the Study of Wealth Inequality. And today, we are delighted to welcome Esther Duflo to INSEAD as the inaugural Distinguished Visitor in Business and Society. Esther is the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics in the Department of Economics at MIT, and a co-founder and co-director of the Abul, Abul, Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, which most of you will know as JPAL. In her research, she seeks to understand the economic lives of the poor with the aim of helping to design and evaluate social policies. She's written dozens of influential economics papers. She's won a MacArthur Genius Grant, a John Bates Clark Medal, the Princess of Asturias Award for the Social Sciences. She's the editor of the American Economic Review. I could go on. Uh, but my favorite is that she's had a full-length profile in The New Yorker, which is perhaps the rarest of honors uh, for an economist. Her book, Poor Economics, A Radical Rethinking of the Way to Fight Global Poverty, co-written with uh, Abhijit Banerjee, won the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award in 2011, and has been translated into more than 17 languages. It's a real pleasure to have you with us today uh, to come and talk to us about why economists should be better plumbers. And please join me, everyone, in welcoming Esther. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Can you hear me? Right, wonderful. So what I'm going to talk today is the economist as plumber. And I appreciated the intro slide, which has a a picture of, of, a, of a tap, because that's about it as far as real plumbing is concerned that you're going to see, because I think of plumbing in a different way for the purpose of this talk. So uh, by way of background, uh, economists increasingly get uh, the opportunity to uh, operate in the real world, not just with macroeconomic advices, which used to be the case with the Chicago boys, but uh, in uh, intervening in designing new markets, designing new policies, etc. So, for example, uh, they are involved in designing auctions for uh, uh, broadband. They are involved in designing uh, a school assignment mechanism. Uh, in, in my work, I'm in, involved in uh, advising on uh, the design of some particular social transfers. And as economists do so, they must be they must start. Engaging with not only the broad idea behind the policies, for example, the broad ideas, auction theory tells you some stuff that one should do or one should do when designing an auction, but also the details of how things get implemented in practice. And there are two reasons for that, which I'm going to elaborate in great detail over the course of the hour. The first one is that policymakers don't care enough about the details, so you cannot rely on them to take that job on, to say, well, I'm giving you the broad architecture and you just figure it out later. And that would not be so important if the details were not uh, relevant. But the second part of my argument is that those details turned out to matter a great deal. So to give you an illustrative example and to have at least one example that has anything to do with actual plumbing, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a project, on, uh, an example on water supply in Morocco. Uh, uh, that I was involved with a few years ago. So the city of Tangiers and its contractor, Veolia, had uh, recognized the need to facilitate the poor's access to running water in their homes. So at some level, the broad policy concept is there. It would be good for people to have access to water in their home. In order to make that happen, they had to have some you know, basic engineering work, both financial engineering and real engineering. The real engineering involved laying down pipes. Uh, uh, making sure that there is sewer, etc. So you can't have water without sanitation. So Veolia did all that work, massive, real uh, engineering work. And then they also needed to have a way for people to finance the access to, to water. So what they did is that they offered interest-free loan. Veolia was offering interest-free loan to, to households. So in principle now, anybody who, could, uh, who wanted to had the physically the possibility of getting access uh, to water. And in addition, they could get an interest-free loan to finance it, so it would be also be possible financially. But uh, despite having done all this work, <coughs> almost nobody subscribed. The take-up of that policy was very low. So one possibility is that people are just not interested at the price at which it was offered, which is roughly at cost. That's not, the, it's not, it's not valuable to people. That's possible. 
in that case, you know, fine. But in fact, it seems that it was not the case because what we did was to do a door-to-door um, -door campaign at people's home in a randomly selected home, roughly one house in every two houses, offering people the option to sign up on the spot, so reducing the cost to sign up. So instead of having to go to City Hall to give your uh, uh, papers, identification paper, etc., uh, our field officer would take photos and uh, transmit those photos to the City Hall. So basically make the um, uh, administrative barriers much lower. And doing this intervention increased the take-up tremendously. Uh, and that allowed us, in fact, to look at the effect that having access to water has on people. And we found a, a <coughs> very positive effect on people's self-reported happiness, change in use of time, of course, uh, self-reported happiness, and they continue to pay for the bills, etc. So clearly, it is something that they, they, they thought was valuable at the end of the day. But despite all of the, you know, the 99% of the work had been done, like the heavy-duty engineering work, but this small thing that people had not paid attention to, that of course, if you want to access a program, you need to apply for it, was not uh, thought about. And that had a large impact on the effectiveness of, of all of these other expenditures that had been done before. So that is kind of the example that I want you to keep in mind in terms of what's the, uh, what, why detail both are forgotten sometimes and why they turned out to matter. <coughs> so I'm going to argue uh, that we need to do that. I'm going to argue that in more details. But as economists, that if we, have, if we want to be active in the real world, which I do want to, as a, we need to be willing to do that, the problem is that getting into such details, the details of the implementation of policies, requires a little bit of a mindset change for economists, because we are not trained to think about such things. Uh, we are trained to think through models which are almost designed to abstract of any of these pesky complications, which is very helpful because it helps us think about the, the world in an organized way. But it is not very helpful as a guidance to uh, to concrete situations. Uh, it's not sufficient as a guidance to concrete situations where such models are not very able to predict what it is that's going to happen. You need to be able to work, or willing to work without that safety net. So uh, you need to be willing to make educated guesses. You need to be able to experiment. You need to think and you need to start it again. So I was kind of trying to look for a word to describe what I think this is. And uh, Al Ross has a very well-known paper. The first time I gave this talk was the Eli lecture, which Al Ross had invited me to give. So it was kind of, he was on my mind. He has a very well-known paper on the economies of engineers, which I'm going to describe in a minute, what he, has, what he means for that. That's so it's not quite engineers, the one level below. I believe Banardi had been talking of, of us as craftsmen. I'll go back to that. Uh, so, um, so I thought this was closer to, to what I had in mind. And with this idea of trying something out and tinkering and you know, maybe refitting again, I thought plumbing would be a good, uh, good idea, a good word. So the plumbing idea is that is focusing not on what policy should be implemented, but given that you want to do something, which could be that, say, the policymaker is giving you that objective. It's not something that you're discussing, or it could be something that you come up with yourself. <coughs> How? focus on the very practical details of the implementation of such policies. So that's the plumbing mindset. I'm not thinking to argue today that all we should do as economists is plumbing. In fact, not even that all I should do myself or that any individual should do is plumbing. All I'm trying to convince you is that some people should do some plumbing some of the time. That is, there is some social and some scientific value on plumbing. I hope I'll convince you on the social part, the scientific part you'll see. Um, so let me give you a bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'll define what I mean a little bit more specifically by plumbing, by contrasting it to two other models of what economists could be and are, scientists and engineers. Then uh, elaborate for why policymakers need plumbing. Then conditional on policymakers needing plumbers, why us, why economists, why not? lawyers or technicians or consultants. Uh, then the relationship between plumbing and experiments, uh, which is because I mostly run experiments. And then finally, 
whether plumbing has any chance to tell us something of use to science and not just to the world. So let's talk a bit about engineer, scientist, and, uh, and uh, plumber. So Roth, in his uh, 2002 uh, paper, argued that uh, economists should be willing to, to, uh, to become engineers. He's talking about market design. So I don't know if you are, how many of you are familiar with Al Roth, but he's someone who became famous for, uh, he has a Nobel Prize, he's like that famous. Uh, but uh, uh, for uh, designing markets, um, some, for example, one of the very uh, famous examples is a market for residents uh, looking for jobs uh, uh, in, in the US. So people finish their medical studies, they need to be matched to hospitals, and there is a market that does that. And this market has been organized by him. I'll talk to this, about this market. He organized any number of school assignment mechanism in Boston, in New York, and in uh, many other cities, they kind of help design how parents should refer their preferences and how schools can, you know, what kind of uh, software can be used to uh, match these preferences to the need of the schools. He works on kidney exchange, who recently has been interested in like um, market for these repugnant, repugnant markets, etc. And so he's very interested in making market work. He's not just interested in the theory of it. And he says, a market design involves a responsibility for detail, a need to deal with all of a market's complications, not just its principal features. Designers, therefore, cannot work only with the simple conceptual models used for theoretical insight into the general working of markets. Instead, a market design calls for, for an engineering approach. So he's drawing the, the, the contrast between the purely scientific approach, where you can start from a set of assumptions, from there you can write nice theorem that are going to give you clear prediction in some cases. And if those assumptions are not satisfied, maybe it's a mess, so you don't have a good, nice, <laughs> close form theoretical result. That's the end of the theory. I think very nice. There are, you know, he has contributed to this theory. But if you want to design a real market, that's not going to be, that's not going to cut it. Because you're going to need to, you know, address whatever is needed in that market. So, for example, to, to take the example of the, the resident matches, uh, by the time he was asked to, to work on this problem, the existing resident matches had collapsed. And the reason it had collapsed is because uh, it was not able to handle couples. So couples who are, you know, at, as it turns out, uh, medical students spending a lot of time together tend to marry each other. So there are many people where, many, not very many, but enough people, a fair substantial minority of people who are, who want to be matched in the same city. You think that's kind of a detail. It's a detail, it turns out that uh, there was no theory to, to solve, there was no way to address this problem really in theory. So what it did is that is to try some stuff out, then simulate the functioning of the market using big computer to say this is how this market would work if I use these rules. And finally come up with a set of rules that work and satisfies good property of matching people to, to jobs in the vast majority of situations where couples can be in the same place and they are roughly happy compared to being in another situation. So there, uh, he says, well, there is this one feature that I cannot handle in theory. It doesn't mean that I don't need to handle it in practice uh, because practice is there and therefore I'm going to, uh, I'm going to simulate it, okay? <coughs> so this is, the <coughs> this is the idea. You take the, you, you, you get as close as possible to a possible solution. You simulate it out. If it doesn't work, you tinker in your lab. Right, because this can all be done before uh, things being launched. Now the plumber go one step further, which is they, say they take that engineering situation, which as far as we understand the problem should work, and they implement it in reality. So the difference between the plumber and the engineer is the engineer knows the problem that he's trying to solve, or she is trying to solve, but she might not have the theoretical tools to do it, so she's simulating the, the hell out of it. The plumber doesn't necessarily even know what is going to turn out to be relevant once he tries something out. For example, the engineers have been you know, working on uh, a school assignment mechanism. They might have, uh, and they came up uh, with uh, uh, good systems that in principle uh, should encourage, should be where the best uh, strategy for parents 
is to reveal your preference truthfully. Okay, so in Boston, there is a, I live in the Boston School District. It's one district for many, many schools. So I should be ranking my preferences uh, for the, the, the different schools. And then, I, in principle, the optimal strategy for me is to do it truthfully. And then the you know, matching algorithm implemented by Al Ross and my colleague Parag Patak will solve for the right solution. The problem is that, so the, the, the plumbing problem that uh, I have spent a lot of time discussing with Parag about is that parents do not believe that it is in fact the optimal so solution. So for example, so how do you communicate with parents to convince them that not only that, that it is what they should do, uh, how do you, how many schools should parents rank? In the optimal, in the, in the, in theory, uh, all of them. That way you'll have all the information. In practice, we know that people, you know, that don't have infinite amount of uh, attention. So maybe what they tell you after the second or third school is irrelevant. In fact, they change their mind. We know that. So how many schools they should rank? Uh, that's not something where you can have very good theoretical guidance because it depends on the level of attention and patience and the ability to gather information. We just don't, don't know. Uh, should, how do you break tie? In principle, what's efficient should be a single lottery to, to break all the tie. But people find it like absolutely abhorrent that they get screwed once and for all by having this bad lottery number. So they prefer to have a lottery per school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are not these are problems that are real problems, which you don't even know that they are real problems until you've tried to do it, and you've been to as Parag has to a lot of school meetings and being insulted by parents. So you learn this the hard, the hard way. So you must make guesses, you get it wrong, and then you will try and, and, and try again. So Parag, this is how he, con he, he, he concludes his own kind of uh, 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 voyage towards these things. He said, what really matters for school choice designs are basic insight about straightforward incentives, so that's the basic economics, transparency, avoiding inefficiency through coordination of offers, and well-functioning aftermarket and influencing input to the design, including applicant decision making and the quality of schools. So these are the things that these things matter. Interestingly, some of the issues examined in the extensive theoretical literature on school choice matching market design, mostly written by him, uh, uh, are less important for practical design. <coughs> and I think it's worth uh, sort of emphasizing uh, uh, what I was saying, that you don't know until you know. It is worth emphasizing that it's only with the benefit of several design case studies that we are beginning to understand which issues are quantitatively important. <laughs> So this is how, you know, sort of the best in our profession, Barack being one of them, is able to span the world between being a scientist and a plumber, and therefore, I think, doing something useful for, for, for the world. So this is kind of, I hope now you understand what I, as a broad level, what I'm talking about when I talk about plumbing. And there are really, in the, in the plumbing issues, I see two big categories of uh, plumbing issues. The one is what I call the design of the tap, which is the, apparent, the, the apparently irrelevant details. And the other is uh, the piping issues, which is things that are not apparently irrelevant, but are a little bit on the boring uh, side. So for example, uh, fun flow, when you have programs, like how the money goes from point A to point B, authorization mechanism, who is responsible for what, who signs up for what, sort of the incentive architecture under which all of the programs are laid over. Uh, so I'll give you very briefly two, um, two, small, two, two examples, one of each. So in terms of the design of the TAP, uh, it's a very nice paper uh, by uh, Abhijit Banerjee, Rima Hanna, Kyle Benolken, and Sue, Sue Marto, he has only one name, uh, which is about the Rasking program in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, so the Raskin program in Indonesia provides eligible households with uh, 15 kilo per month of heavily subsidized rice. It is uh, centrally funded, but it's locally implemented by village head, and it is rife with corruption. And one of the problems is information about the program is very poor. So people do not know what they are eligible for, at what price, etc. And as a result, not everybody gets access to the program, and the one who get access to the program tend to overpay. So when everything is taken into account, the eligible people receive only about a third of the subsidies that they are entitled to. So you could think of like a number of things that you could do to try and improve that. 
And the government was interested in one like plumbing issue, which is how about we address this information issue by providing people with a card that tells them whether or not they are eligible and to, to what. And they asked uh, Ben and Rima, who have been involved in many, many projects in Indonesia, to help them evaluate the effect of doing that. And as they did that, so they, they, they did that in the context of a large uh, randomized controlled trial where they selected 378 out of 572 villages. And as they did that, uh, they decided to do you know, even more detailed uh, plumbing things and say, well, let's look at a number of uh, details that one could change. So here's a card that the government was thinking of sending. So it has the name of the uh, person who gets it, etc. And I thought, well, maybe we can change the design of the card a bit. Uh, so these are two cards now. It might not be completely obvious to you, but they are different. Uh, the second card has a little number two here, uh, which indicates the price that they should pay. The other price doesn't have it. So what's one detail? Other possibility, does it matter whether you have a physical card versus receiving your, the information on a, on a list that is posted in the village? Third thing is, does it matter when you get the card that uh, it's also widely advertised that such cards has been given, such that there is common knowledge among you and the program officer that cards have been given. So not only you know that you are entitled to something, but you know that the officer knows that you know that you have received that information. Okay? So those are the things that were uh, particularly relevant and uh, one also for is the card conveying some accountability? So can you increase the accountability threat of the card by adding clip of coupons that the official has to return? So they did that. These are all, you know, if you, you know, see this one, for example, really tiny minor things in the way that already a detail is being changed. And um, it turns out that it makes a, a, a big difference. So first of all, the card about... Uh, <clears throat> double the amount of subsidies that people got. So from one third, they go to two thirds. Combination of uh, being more likely to get it and getting more if they get it. Secondly, uh, making the information common knowledge uh, uh, double the impact of a card again. So that was very important. The clip off didn't matter, so it's not about accountability. Uh, so this, the, the results, the specific results matter less than the fact that A, just giving a card without changing anything else to the program changed things. It had a huge effect. And B, the very specific details on how the card is designed and distributed also matters. By the way, because this was done in request to a government, this was scaled up uh, nationally shortly after it was finished. So this, now this card, in the best design that they liked, it was, it was distributed to, I think, 68 million people uh, uh, immediately after to say that this has impact. So that's an example of you know, what you can do with, with the design of the tap. An example of uh, more uh, uh, design of the pipes is uh, uh, a reform I was involved uh, uh, in, uh, in evaluating, uh, again, ag along with Abhijit Banerjee and Rima Hanna, and, uh, sorry, and Roini Pandey and Clément Humbert, where what we did is to work with the government on a reform of the fund flow program for a workfare program. So this is a type of issues that economists don't tend to be very interested in. They're interested in e-governance and stuff like that. But the idea that you should be interested in, in how the flow, what triggers a flow of fund between a place or another, it seems to be a bit more like below the radar for us. It's not what we tend to do as a living. But it turns out that it's very important because worldwide, most of decentralized programs are funded centrally, but implemented locally. So how the fund flow circulates is important. So what is typically the case in most decentralized programs that are implemented locally, but funded centrally, is that the lo lowest level of government, in this case, it's the, it's the panchet, uh, receives an advance. And when they are finished with the advance, they ask for a refill from their level immediately above them which then ask for a ratification by the level above them, which then ask for a ratification at the state level. So the Indian system has these four levels. Some other system might have fewer, etc. But the point is that uh, it's kind of a cumbersome administrative process. 
And, it, and before, it's a, because it's a cumbersome administrative process, it has to be based on advances because it takes too long to have all of this authorization. And it's not that the local government can lend the money to the government. So what happens is that they get an advance and then they kind of justify ex post that they have spent the advance. But that doesn't, that doesn't work very effectively. Uh, so the justification is poor, and therefore the accounting is poor, and therefore that there is actually very little transparency and, and, and a lot of, and that could be responsible for a lot of leakage. So what we looked at is a reform of the system where you go from that system to that system, where now the panchayat logs in into an electronic database after they've spent the money and say, I've spent, or typically after they've, this is for hiring people, so we said, I've hired Max Abile for two weeks, give me money so that I can pay him. And so now with the, you know, because it's an electronic database, in principle it should be more or less instant. In practice it was a bit slower than instant. So we can wait till the money comes to pay him. So the big advantage of the system is that A, it removes all of these intermediate layers. B, it creates transparency because now you are, you don't get an advance that ex post you are asked to justify if you get around to do it. You don't get the money unless you say what you've done with it, so that allows for direct verification. So what we've done is looking at the, at the impact of this program. And what you could see is that, so this is spending under the program. There's a lot of fluctuation, which are partly seasonal, partly due to other problems of the program. But the key is that you can see that the red line is below the blue line during the intervention period. So the places where the program was introduced, which was in about um, 1,000 uh, uh, panchet, compared to 2,000 where it was not, uh, you can see a decline in expenditure. So there you can say, well, it's maybe because the system is so new and complicated, they don't know how to use it. So we went ahead and looked at whether they do the same thing with the money that, or they do less things. And so we did a survey of people asking them you know, how much they've worked for the program. And there you don't see any systematic difference between the treatment and the control. So basically they spend about 17% less money to achieve about the same thing. So the rest is uh, presumably a reduction in corruption. So then we look at various things to prove that it is in fact a, a reduction in corruption. The detail doesn't hugely matter. Uh, but what matters is that uh, uh, this thing that is in principle we don't spend our time thinking about, which we kind of would leave to public finance accountants or something like that, turns out to have impact on things that as economists we care about, which is incentives and accountability and corruption, and of course eventually uh, how well the, the, the program uh, functions. So that, those, those are examples that you can you know, keep in mind of the type of things that I mean about, about plumbing. Now, why do we need a uh, plumber? Why can't policymakers not do it? Uh, well, they, I suppose they could do it, but they don't. Uh, they tend to not really, um, uh, that might depend on policymakers, but the one I hang out with them to not be very interested in plumbing issues. One recent example, I spent a lot of time working on India, one recent and really egregious example was uh, the other event of November 8, uh, 2000, uh, 2016, was 86% uh, of the currency in circulation in India disappeared overnight. In that, it was declared that it was not legal tender anymore. All of the 500,000 rupees bills were declared to be illegal tender. What you, could, you had till the end of December to exchange them. From that moment, from November 8, you could not use them anymore you had till December 31 to exchange them. And various ideas why you should have this program, in a sense it doesn't really matter, but maybe it was, it was designed to, the hope was that it would root out corruption by, because all of the cash, illegally uh, uh, accumulated cash would not come back, and so the people would become, the corrupt people would lose all of their money. So that was kind of idea number one, and there was other idea that it would be good to have less cash in the economy. Doesn't really matter, but that was, there was ideas of why it would be a good thing to do. But the thing is that there was absolutely zero, but I mean zero attention uh, uh, given to how it would work in practice. Uh, the, the bills, the $2,000 bills, 
the 2,000 rupees bills that replaced the 1,000 rupee bills didn't have quite the same form. They were a bit smaller. So the ATM couldn't deliver them. Uh, the, uh, uh, the banks, that, the central bank that was printing the money was not print, you know, didn't have the physical capacity to print enough money. Uh, the rules were not in place so that in, uh, in, uh, in three weeks uh, after the November 8, in the three weeks that followed, there were 100 different set of rules issued to when you can change and how much you can change and what you can do so that people were completely confused. And as a result, for a while, really, for the, until uh, um, even well into January, it was a mess, complete mess uh, uh, in, in, in Indian villages and, and, and cities with the money. Um, so we just think that we have this great idea. The fact that it's, it's going to create this massive commotion in an economy of one billion people is, was uh, not really given too much, too much thought. So that's an extreme example, I think, of plumbing doesn't matter, but the one that you know is kind of fixes idea. So why it is that they don't that policymakers don't pay attention to details? One of it is none of us really are very good at paying attention to details. Uh, we tend to, you know, economic agents tend to fail to experiment. We tend to stay, you know, we tend to have a fair amount of inertia. It's risky to experiment. You have something that works more or less, you might as well stick with it. It's also difficult uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to pay attention to so many things. And, uh, us, again, not just policymakers, but us in our lives, when we have so many things that we need to take care, think about, we, we will tend to focus on a few dimensions. And how we arrive at the few dimensions on which we focus is not necessarily particularly optimal. So uh, um, Rima Hannas and Dil Müller and Josh Schwarz have this, int have this interesting uh, paper on uh, uh, seaweed farmers in Indonesia showing that they, they have many things that they could think about in growing seaweed. They pay a lot of attention to three things, but not the most important things. And it's kind of very difficult to make, get them to switch to other things that they could look at. And policymakers is a bit like that. But there is worse. I think the problem is worse for bureaucrats compared to people. They are even less detail-oriented than the average person. Uh, we, in our book, we describe uh, the government policy as being characterized by uh, ideology, ignorance, and inertia. So programs are conceived in ideology, or could be intuition, in ignorance of reality in the field, and tend, tend to persist uh, out of sheer inertia. We, we, we don't assign any malign uh, reason for that. It's just uh, the way things are. But it's a nice book by James Scott called Seeing Like a State which puts almost some agency behind this desire to not look at people the way they are, because it kind of would force them a bit to become the way they are. So if you ignore the reality of people as they are as a policymaker, you can hope that they will become the way you want them to be. So, um, so that's uh, it's the illusion of what, what they call high modernism, uh, which may, we may have been a little bit um, you know, suffering from in, in recent years in let's say at least in the US and to some extent in France, is <coughs> hoping that if we will people to be uh, liberal-minded and progressive, they will become that uh, till you know, at some point sort of uh, collapses. So, <coughs> so that's the first point. Policymakers don't tend to pay attention to details. The second point is they really should, because it matters. <coughs> and otherwise well-conceived policy uh, fail because the, de the details are not taken into account. So I'll give you one uh, example of that, which is uh, um, uh, regulation um, in, in Gujarat. So this, uh, Gujarat is one of the most polluted states in India, so much so that the Supreme Court issued an order that uh, every firm need to ha that is a ha high pollution potential must have an environmental audit uh, paid for by themselves, by a private company. Uh, so they must hire an auditor, and the auditor gives them a report every, every year, and that report is uh, uh, given to the government as well. So it has a lot of nice aspects uh, in principle, but the problem is that uh, the system didn't work beautifully. So this is the auditor report for a sample of firms for one particular uh, polluter, SPM, and you can see that the farms tend to be really huddled around the threshold, just below the threshold 
of acceptable pollution. Uh, so that's nice. That means they are really like e efficient. But then when you, what we did is that a couple of weeks later, we go back to the same farm and take the same pollutant. And this is what we find. So it's not that the farm are very efficient, it's that the reports are very efficient at uh, showing them. And in particular, you can see that you don't even have this very low pollution farm are not even there, which suggests that the farms don't even go to, the, to do the measurement. So what happened here? Well, they failed to take into account conflict of interest. Uh, if, you, if the farm pays the auditor, the auditor is going to feel that they might as well give them the report that they are expecting. Very much like you know, when we were talking after the Enron scandal or the 2008 crisis of the problem with corporate auditing and, uh, and uh, uh, rating by uh, uh, agencies. So, <coughs> <coughs> so on the one hand, so that means that, you know, it's a bit uh, sad because it means that even in good environment where you're really trying to do something, if you don't get into the account the details, you can really completely fail in your policy. But on the bright side, it also means that even in, in bad environment, where it's very difficult to move the needle on very fundamental policy issues, where there is no policy agreement on some issues, uh, if you're someone who is kind of keeping the trains running on time, you can actually do a lot of good without having any principal position simply by uh, trying to do what is on the book better. So there is, in fact, substantial scope for action, even in bad policy environment. So people talk about the importance of institution, and I'm the first to agree. But it, this, the fact that plumbing matters so much, and even the most well-intentioned people don't pay attention to plumbing, is that when you don't have someone who is well-intentioned at the top, but you still have the machine in place, you can just quietly, quietly make it work better. And I had a lot of conversation with Cass Sunstein, who was working at OIRA, the Office of Regulation, in the Obama administration. And there was a moment where there is very little they could do. The, government, the Congress was completely obst obstructionist. There is very little that they could you know, effectively do, except uh, issue new uh, executive orders. But one thing that they did is just to try to make the existing things work. And sometimes this has huge consequences. So for example, I won't get into the detail because we don't have a lot of time, but there was a, a regulation called uh, uh, free lunch certification, uh, which, uh, which um, basically the idea is that, in fact, it was decided under Bush, I believe, in 2004, that uh, if, a kid, uh, if the parents of a kid are eligible, say, for food stamp, the kid should be automatically eligible for free lunch. So that was there. But then in order to go from this principle to Doing it in practice, you need, there is a number of steps that needs to be taken, which were only partially taken, etc. And what they did in 2012, 2013 is really automatize the process. And at the moment where the Republicans were uh, everywhere talking about deficit, it was a different time, I suppose, um, the 12 million kids got certified in the free lunch program without raising anybody's eyebrow because there was no debate, because they were just implementing something that was already on the books. So this is why you need the plumbers uh, to make sure that, the, the, the good, uh, the, that in good environment you achieve what you want to achieve and to continue to do stuff even when the political situation is not great. Now, why us? We think, well, it's like, why, why, why an economist? Why not a lawyer? Why not someone who knows uh, other things better? And I think economists make good plumber. I have reasons. There are reasons to think that economists make good plumber. On, not on everything. There are some issues that are really are not economic issues and should be dealt with by other people. But there are some issues where we happen to have some mm, skills. So this is where we, you know, we go back. This was the idea on, uh, the already, uh, Banerjee's idea on the economist as craftsman is that, you know, we have few, there are things we understand. We understand uh, behavioral issues, you know, the interplay between psychology and economics. We understand incentives issue. And we understand, that's, I think, a little bit new. We know better than most other people how to think through the market equilibrium consequences of what we do. And those issues, uh, behavioral issues, incentive issues, market economy issues are issues that are going to have impacts uh, on how well a policy works or 
doesn't work and uh, um, that we are you know, well placed to provide advice on. Uh, since we are a little bit running out of time, I might not get into the details of all of that. <clears throat> but on behavioral issues, of course, you know, dictator just got the Nobel Prize, so that's another, you know, Nobel Prize famous person who thinks about, about these issues. Policies are for humans. As soon as you have humans, you have behavioral issues, and uh, taking those into account to design programs matters. And it's not straightforward. Because since you're so far from a first best, the moment you tinker something somewhere, you create a problem elsewhere. For example, uh, uh, Ben Handel has a series of lovely papers on health insurance. And so you know, if you force decision, that's nice, because you force people to pay attention. But then you're going to create an adverse selection problem that you don't have when people are not thinking very hard about what they are doing. So how do you arbitrage the two to arrive at an outcome that's efficient from the people's point of view? Of course, incentive uh, policies are not only for humans, but implemented by humans. Uh, and, so st and the way that things are implemented have influences for the incentive for the people who implement them. So there is all sorts of work now on the personal economics of the states. We started thinking about you know, why, and all those issues about piping, of like who takes decisions, who has authority, etc., has a lot of uh, implications for uh, how the, uh, the government agents are going to implement the policy and therefore whether they will work. Now, we're saying in the business school, often the, the people who are trying to act on our firms, firm maximize profits. Uh, and under, you know, economists are pretty good at understanding these behaviors. And therefore, uh, uh, they, the firms will tend to find every loophole they can in regulation and uh, incentive. And economists can be pretty good at thinking about that and thinking about how to design the regulation to avoid the gaming. So to give you an example of that, that continues my uh, conflict of interest example in environmental regulation. The reason I know this thing on environmental regulation in Gujarat is that I was involved in a project where we helped them reform their system. And we told them, so we knew that there was a conflict of interest. That's why we collected the data that we collected so that we could show it to them. But it was pretty obvious uh, that there would be an issue. And so we thought, okay, fine, let's just change the system to try and break the conflict of interest. And there we didn't have to invent it because we, you know, this had been discussed in the context of financial regulation. We just had to you know, apply our basic economics knowledge to how one uh, 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 does the system. So we proposed a random assignment of auditors to firm. The firms pay a pool that pays the auditors and the, and the auditors are back checked. So now the loyalty is not to the firm, but to the auditor. And we have an instrument to monitor that this, uh, that this behavior is adhered to. So this is what we had in the control group. And this is a treatment group. And this is now a treatment, uh, uh, the, what they report and the back check. So this is uh, control <coughs> and treatment. And you can see that now the treatment is much closer to the truth, it's not quite there, but it's much closer to the truth than in the, than, than in the basic system. Uh, so I, I'm not saying that nobody but an economist could have thought of this, but it's pretty natural for an economist to think of a programs like that. We are the, we have, that's where the training the, does come in. In the interest of time, and to give you a little bit of, uh, little bit of time to, uh, to ask questions, if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to skip this part of it, which is just to argue that if you're a plumber, experimenting makes a lot of sense. Uh, in the sense of not only just experimenting, trying one thing and another one, but doing the randomized experiment. Uh, and the reason is that since we know that we are guessing, uh, we might as well try things out and see what happens. We know that we don't have a good, you know, uh, we, we know that if we are willing to be a plumber, we have to be willing to know, that, to, to admit that we are going to be wrong a lot of the time, that our intuitions are not going to work exactly the way they want. We have to put our best foot forward, but we have to be willing to try it out. And if you have to be willing to try it out, you might, uh, you might as well try it out in a way that allows you to learn something, and hence the, hence the experiment. 
Um, another advantage of running experiments, and that's a very practical ad uh, advantage of working with governments, uh, is two things. First of all, it creates a natural beginning and an end. Otherwise, policy have a tendency to stay in place. So an experiment try, uh, generate a natural sunset clause. Michael Greenstone, when he was in government, was trying to impose that there should be a sunset clause for regulation where they need to be looked at. The other thing is designing experiments, uh, discipline policymaker to think about what it is that is really in their power to make the difference between a tool and an objective. Policymakers tend to describe an objective and say, that's my policy. So that's not your policy, my dear. It's your outcome. What it is that you're going to do in influence the and in fact, doing this in the concept of an, of, in the context of setting up an experiment forces them to make that clear. Let me conclude with this question. So all of that is nice or maybe not nice, but it could be useful for policy. Is it science? Like how it is I am doing this? And uh, that I get, uh, you know, uh, uh, should I get academic rewards to do this? Maybe it doesn't matter for me because I have tenure anyway, but you might wonder if you, you, know, you, you, are, you don't have tenure whether they are, uh, uh, you know, there is scientific value to do this thing. And one thing that comes up is, well, if the details are so context specific, then what do you learn somewhere that is in the form of generalizable knowledge that can be helpful elsewhere? And there, I'll just put the, put the, the point. One is that often the plumbing experiment generate useful variation that you can use to do other things. So in plumbing, for example, you're often interested in increasing the take up of a policy. And the detail of how you increase the take up of a policy in one context might not apply to another context. But if you have generated take up, increased take up, then you can use that to look at the effect of the policy itself. So for example, the reason why we did a plumbing experiment in Morocco was to look at what's the effect of having plumbing. So it, was, uh, so it gives you that, particularly useful for general equilibrium effect, because you can do this plumbing experiment on very large scale, and then you can look at equilibrium effect. Another thing that uh, maybe I will uh, just say that and stop there is that one particularly useful uh, role of plumbing and is to shine the spotlight on problems. So for example, uh, it's, uh, in, a, in a school experiment, uh, I, 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 I talked about some issues like breaking ties in lottery. Should you have a single lottery or multiple lottery? The work zone issue, should there be a work zone for people where they are entitled to go to the closed zone? And then this perception that a, a, a particular scheme is manipulable. So those, those are all plumbing questions. But these three plumbing questions, they actually generated significant theoretical work. So people, in fact, uh, for the Singapore people, the grandson of the, of, uh, um, the prime minister, or maybe the prime minister in, in making, Lee, who is now a junior uh, faculty at Harvard, his uh, job market paper was on trying to design obviously strategy-proof mechanism, the, 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 the theoretical concept of an obviously strategy-proof mechanism, which is a mechanism is not only strategy-proof, but transparently so. So what's the, what's the feature of such mechanism? Why are they helpful, et cetera? So, this type, so the plumbing experiments will generate the useful problems that other economists, the scientists, should work on. After all, we are in applied science, and we might as well work on the, on the relevant problems. So let me stop here, and thank you very much. So I left about eight minutes, if I We have a few minutes for questions, uh, and people can come around with the microphones if you put up your hand. I see one. You can belt it out. I'll put here. Yeah, Singapore Don't might be sad back. if they're still here. Yeah, they're still here. Thank you. Uh, this was an amazingly interesting, uh, interesting talk. I'm myself from Pakistan, so uh, I see a lot of us in all of those examples. But like my first question is, uh, do, you, do, you, do you think that businesses themselves can actually be good plumbers because businesses are designed inherently to be always looking for operational efficiencies, always tinkering, right? So, so if somehow the businesses' interests can be aligned with whatever the government policies want implemented, wouldn't businesses be a very, very good tool 
to be plumbers, uh, and especially talking in context of emerging markets in poor countries. My second question is, um, so, for example, uh, in a country like Pakistan, middlemen have a lot uh, have a lot of force, right? Because the government structures it themselves are pretty weak. Uh, so they, so the bro the brokers, uh, let's say in uh, in wheat farming, right? So between the farmers and the end buyers, the middlemen have a lot of power, almost like a mafia. So when you decide, even when you become a plumber and you're tinkering with the models, there will be like a very very strong resistance from the existing cultural norms and the models that are already available. Might not be a government model. But that's how the society has been set up, right? And in that case, uh, an economist or a government policymaker or whoever, uh, wouldn't this plumbing and tinkering be very, very difficult in like in absence of a strong government structure? <coughs> right. So on the on the first question, um, so first there is this question of whether businesses are better uh, and are good at always getting it right and tinkering, etc. And I think they are better on average because they probably they don't they, they have they don't have the seeing like a state problem. But I think they are not necessarily always perfect. So even businesses get it wrong. Take the Veolia example in Morocco. It was a business that has completely not seen that they needed to to do one more step in order to justify all the engineering expenditure they had done. So. In fact, the, the, the most modern business, Silicon Valley, etc., they tinker all the experiments all the time. That's A-B testing. But the, the, in the sort of regular businesses, uh, there are not as many. I think they are sometimes further than the, uh, of the efficiency frontier than you might uh, believe. So that's just a gen. And I think this maybe is changing under the influence of A-B testing, where people feel that, oh, we could try more things, and we could experiment. And, but I think there is often a lot of margin for improvement even there. Uh, um, then, well, you know, in, in some cases, they could intermediate with government. That's a separate question. I think that depends a lot of the problem. On the question of the resistance, uh, so it, it is in general something that is asked often, which is, oh, it's very nice to look at the effect of this policy and that policy, but isn't everything determined by institutions and norms, etc.? So. To be honest, it's precisely the existence of plumbing that makes me think that, uh, in fact, that's not the case, which is even when, the, uh, I think in, in, in some cases, you're right, there is a constraint and we hit a snag. For example, in, in India, when we change the corruption by changing the fund flow, the district officials were so upset that they managed to get the program removed. So you know, we did hit that problem. But in the other hand, since we showed the effect on the, on the FISC, we managed to get the program scaled up nationwide. Nation so there is, a, there is that fight going on, political fight. But it is also the case that in a lot of cases, everybody is in principle aligned to arrive to a given objective. It's just, you know, it's more about competence than about deep, fundamental, anti-poor conspiracy. I do believe that sometimes that's the problem, but often, there is a lot of things we can do even within that, and I sort of taking advantage of those gaps is something that, uh, that, that I would like to, to encourage. I think we have time for uh, one or two quick questions. So we'll, we'll start there, and then... Uh, Maybe I can just uh, collect a question and, and give one so people have collect like three questions. And okay. Is there a microphone anywhere near there? He has a microphone, so in the meantime, you can... Why don't we start with yours? Sure. Thank you. Um, so um, um, my name is Mohammed Ashkar. I'm from Saudi Arabia and previously worked in the Islamic Development Bank. And we, um, we implemented some, um, you know, randomized trials, experiments and so on on some of our projects to find out whether they were um, impactful or not. Now, the problem we faced is that in almost every time we come down to randomized trials, we face the issue of budgeting. Of what? Budgeting. Because it is really expensive to actually segregate uh, different villages and take samples from here and there and then start doing surveys over and over. It is uh, A, costly, B, most of the countries or governments would eventually resist that, that implementation because it's just too costly. Um, so, has, 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 so my question is, has there any work that... Uh, that was done to basically reduce the cost of these experiments. Was there, for example, a usage of 
big data or um, some something like you know more of like uh, efficient way to collect data at a low cost than the the usual you know surveying and so on. So, th thank you for your talk. Um, my question for you is, we're, we're talking about these large social sector projects. Most of them are designed by economists in Washington or let's say in capitals of countries and then they, by, by bureaucrats and then they deliver the projects in the rural areas or wherever. How do we convince the IFIs or the governments to, or the economists who are designing these projects to stop or be, become more plumberish? instead of just being scientists or engineers? I mean, uh, h how do we actually implement this in, in, in real life uh, scenarios? Thank you, just last, last one, therefore, one, one issue is around uh, how do you deal with tinkering with humans? Uh, so the aspect of, you know, do no harm, and therefore, how do you tinker with humans? And the other aspect, which is, how do you reward the tinkerers? I, uh, we're recognizing the, uh, the fallibility of government and therefore it's saying we, we don't have the best practice and therefore we're gonna test as we go along. Thank you. <coughs> so on the cost of uh, RCT, uh, it's funny because uh, this question used to be asked a lot like 10 years ago and it sort of uh, disappeared. So it's, uh, it was backed back for, it's not more expensive to do an RCT than to collect data for anything else. Uh, but then at the end of the day, you're going to have data that you can actually use for uh, uh, providing you with, uh, with uh, uh, reliable, reliable evidence. So the, 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 the issue of the cost is, uh, is not that large because it's, it, I mean, it's, it, at the moment you want to collect data, that's going to cost some money for sure. But so much data is being collected. Almost all government have at least 1% of their budget devoted to evaluation in their and then this one percent of the budget, 99.9 percent, .9 is wasted. <laughs> so we can just we, we don't need to increase the one percent. We just need to spend spend the one percent better. So that said, I think your point about using administrative data, using big data, that's definitely there. And there is a lot of effort now to use existing administrative data better and to collect new data if it needs to in a more efficient way. People use phones. People use in a lot of what I, I showed you, for example, the the the. the the project in Bihar on corruption, it was m almost only administrative data. And then uh, we matched it to a census that they were collecting anyway. So it was all kind of the cost of the data collection was very, very limited. And there is much more work along this direction. And there should be much more work on, that, on this direction. And in general, I think governments start seeing the need to be more transparent about their data and have more data out and researchers looking at it. So I think that's a very good way to think about in terms of the, the, the capital, and, uh, and I, I think you're completely right, and this is kind of one reason of the three I. Uh, less so in Washington than you know, the capital of the developing countries, uh, where people just do not get out ever. So in Delhi, they sit down and they think about the dream person, and they design a policy for the dream person, and the nurse needs to be. Uh, in the center and in the village and in there and in there and they've never gone out and they don't realize what it involves to go from you know five kilometers by foot when it's hundred degrees. So, um, and I think that the the involvement in uh, in uh, in evaluations and in randomized control trials helps a little bit because it it puts people this is what i was saying about the the difference between your dreams and the instrument that you have in mind so your dream might be there should be a nurse available for every person who has a headache so that they can get uh, but that's not an, an an instrument if you design a policy you can just write it down if you start saying well you know we're going to have you know evaluate something that you that's not, it can't possibly be the instrument that you're going to put in place. So that helps a little bit in getting people more, uh, more uh, involved in the details. But you're right that it's, it's a bit of an uphill battle because that's not the culture. And um, on the tinkering with the humans, uh, so it's like any other work that you do and it needs to be, you need to make sure that you need to be thinking about the ethics of what it is you're doing at a given point in time. Uh, 
especially now that we are working with governments, we are working on very large scale. There is always a, you know, some soul searching at the beginning of a project of what is it that I expect for impact? Uh, do I expect any uh, possible negative impact? If I expect negative impact, how would they be managed? Or if there are too many negative impacts, then I'm not going to be involved in doing research on that. I mean, that's the only thing you can do. Okay. Thank you very much. We are out of time, so we can't take any more questions. I have just very two quick things. The first is to publicly thank all of the INSEAD staff who helped pull Esther's visit together. You guys did a great job, and it was a tremendous amount of work, so thank you. Uh, the second is, normally we would now give you an INSEAD baseball cap that you can wear around to thank you for visiting, and we can still get you one if you want one, but instead the uh, Dean of Research has actually generously allocated a fund of 10,000 euro to uh, go towards seed funding for poverty alleviation projects based around the ideas of your work. Uh, and we hope the NCI community will take advantage of that and uh, be inspired by you. You're Thank great. you so much for coming and speaking with us today. Thank you very much.